I mean, we're literally the worst nation on the planet. It would be um, insignificant diversion. This would be a massive diversion. The Iranians understood that the United States could never again be trusted. If Iran, if Israel uses a nuclear weapon against Iran, I can pretty much guarantee that Iran will destroy all of Israel. Israel will cease to exist. We are talking about the potential of using nuclear weapons. I think things have been triggered inside Iran. I'd be very curious to hear from the IAEA. The United States failed to deliver. It turns out the United States uh, lied the entire time. We had no expectation to believe the Iran, uh, Israel would ever accept a ceasefire. To this mistrust, the U.S. recently proposed a ceasefire in response to escalating conflict. Iranian officials reportedly discussed this proposal, only to see hopes dashed when Israel launched a targeted assassination against senior Hezbollah official Hassan Nasrallah after he agreed to the terms. Analysts say that Israel's action and the U.S.'s lack of intervention solidified Iran's belief that the U.S. cannot be trusted as an impartial mediator. The assassination's fallout has led to heightened animosity from Iran toward both the U.S. and Israel. Reports indicate that the Iranians felt betrayed, viewing this incident as a calculated move by the U.S. to use diplomacy as a cover while allowing Israel to act with impunity. Observers are now questioning whether any trust remains to facilitate future negotiations, as Iran's leaders see the U.S. actions as the latest in a long line of unfulfilled promises. As Israel's military actions continue, Hezbollah faces significant losses among its senior leaders. However, for years, Hezbollah's leaders like Hassan Nasrallah have anticipated such outcomes. Nasrallah has long described himself as a living martyr, fully aware of the risks Israel poses to him personally. The organization is structured with a robust chain of command to withstand these challenges, swiftly replacing lost leaders in recent clashes. This readiness allows Hezbollah to maintain its operational cohesion and launch rocket attacks on Israel, even after multiple leadership disruptions. The group's cellular structure enables its units to function independently coordinating effectively in their defense of southern Lebanon. While Israel has demonstrated substantial intelligence capabilities in targeting Hezbollah leaders, analysts note that Hezbollah has been preparing for such a scenario for 18 years, since the 2006 Lebanon War. Its structure remains resilient, able to operate without relying on central leadership. At the same time, Israel continues its operations against Hamas, aiming to secure the Philadelphia corridor between Gaza and Egypt. Israeli forces have now carved a pathway dividing Gaza into northern and southern sectors, suggesting a strategic approach to controlling the region. Despite these efforts, Hamas remains active. Many estimate that about 80% of its tunnel infrastructure is still operational, allowing it to recruit and resupply effectively. Observers suggest that Israel's efforts to dismantle the resistance face limitations, as Hamas has adapted to survive, even amidst heavy losses. The situation with Hezbollah is further complicated by Israel's military strategy, which Hezbollah claims has largely deterred them from retaliating fully. One reason for Hezbollah's measured response has been to protect Lebanese civilians, who face the risk of collective punishment, something Hezbollah describes as a total violation of international law and a tactic that endangers thousands of innocent people. These dynamics highlight a complex and evolving conflict, with each side braced for further confrontation. The situation on the Israel-Lebanon border continues to escalate, and it's clear Israel is choosing a path of increased conflict with Hezbollah. This broader military strategy raises concerns that attention may shift away from Gaza, where the humanitarian crisis deepens. For Hezbollah and Iran, this escalation is risky, as the focus on their involvement may divert attention from the ongoing tragedies faced by Palestinians in Gaza. There's a genuine worry here. If conflict expands to involve Israel and Iran, discourse will likely shift towards global energy security and the impact on international markets, overshadowing the core issue of Palestinian rights. Historically, the fight for Palestine has always risked being sidelined by larger geopolitical issues. Now, there's a critical gamble escalation could mean losing focus on the Palestinian cause altogether. In fact, many experts suggest that resolving the Palestine issue could potentially ease regional tensions. Such a resolution might allow groups like Hezbollah and Iran to deem their involvement unnecessary, thus helping to stabilize the area. However, as history shows, once a conflict spirals to encompass broader international interests, it's exceedingly difficult to return the focus to the original problem and Gaza risks being forgotten. Now, turning to the influence of pro-Israel lobbying in the United States, there are complex dynamics at play. 
While pro-Israel groups like AIPAC wield significant influence in shaping U.S. policy, particularly on issues directly related to Israel, they face limits in other areas. In 1998, after I resigned from my role as a weapons inspector, I witnessed firsthand the lobbying power of groups, like AIPAI, who work to maintain strong relationships with key figures in the U.S. government. I saw how they strategically position themselves not only lobbying senators but influencing media narratives. Yet, despite their strong presence, they face limitations within the U.S. establishment. Notably, the Israeli lobby's power is less pervasive in areas like the energy sector, where U.S. interests tend to dominate. Massive corporations like ExxonMobil carry a level of economic weight that, in terms of energy security, even the Israeli lobby doesn't influence. And while the lobby can exert influence over certain Pentagon decisions, it does not control the Pentagon or the broader military-industrial complex. It's worth noting that military aid to Israel, at $3.8 billion annually, while significant pales in comparison to U.S. defense deals with other allies worldwide. The narrative that Israel alone drives U.S. policy in the Middle East is, therefore, oversimplified. For example, contrary to some perceptions, the 2003 invasion of Iraq wasn't solely a product of Israeli influence. Israeli intelligence had even cooperated with the United Nations to disarm Iraq, rather than supporting the regime change agenda led by the U.S. However, it is true that Israel pursued its own intelligence operations against Iraq. In the early 90s, Israel undertook several secret missions aimed at removing Saddam Hussein, including rehearsals for a high-stakes assassination attempt. These efforts reflect Israel's independent policy interests, which sometimes align with, but are not dictated by U.S. objectives. Tonight, we delve into the intense operations surrounding Israel's efforts to neutralize Saddam Hussein in the 1990s, an endeavor fraught with unexpected twists. Initially, Israeli commandos were set on a high-stakes mission to assassinate Saddam during a rehearsal that turned deadly. What was intended as a simulation suddenly became a live-fire incident a rocket misfired, killing the team stand in Saddam and several commandos. Following this accidental exposure, the operation was leaked to the press, halting any future attempts. Israel then faced a strategic crossroads, leading its military intelligence to pursue an alternative approach to counter the Saddam regime. It was at this point, after the failed mission, that Israel decided to consider the path of disarmament. In fact, I, along with two other UN officials, was part of a team that proposed this strategy directly to Major General Yuri Sagi and other senior Israeli officials. We spent years working with Israeli intelligence to contain Saddam through verified disarmament rather than conflict. The Israeli position, until 1998, became one of cautious engagement, assessing Saddam as a rational actor who could be managed through strategic disarmament and economic incentives. Israel believed that lifting sanctions and applying economic pressure could effectively control Saddam without necessitating regime change. However, by the early 2000s, that strategy shifted dramatically. Despite years of disarmament cooperation, the United States began promoting claims of Iraq possessing weapons of mass destruction, a narrative Israel eventually echoed, though the facts later revealed no such weapons existed. It's crucial to note that while Israel supported the WMD, the primary driver behind the U.S. invasion of Iraq was rooted in American interests, namely, control over oil reserves and asserting regional dominance. While theories about Israel's influence over the invasion persist, the reality is that the U.S. undertook this war with clear self-interest at the forefront. I strongly refute assertions from certain analysts that the U.S. engages militarily for Israel's interests alone. Based on my own experiences, Having served during the 1991 Gulf War as part of an anti-missile operation aimed at protecting Israel from attacks, I can affirm that while cooperation occurs, U.S. strategies are guided primarily by American priorities. Analysts like Chase Freeman and Larry Johnson, whom I respect, share this view. Despite the claims of some businessmen turned analysts, America's military policies, particularly those around the Iraq War, were not driven solely by the so-called Israel lobby. So when we look back at this chapter of Middle Eastern history, it's essential to recognize the nuances while the U.S. and Israel collaborate closely. American policymakers in the Pentagon and State Department often make strategic choices independent of, and at times contrary to, Israel's preferred course. This complex relationship 
illustrates the broader picture that U.S. decisions, especially in matters of war, are typically rooted in America's own interests. Tensions are escalating in the region as Israel plays a dangerous game in Syria, striking targets close to a Russian military base. Recent reports indicate that Israel attacked a warehouse outside the Russian-controlled area in Syria, sparking a response from Russian air defenses. This raises an important question. If Israel deems the cargo on any flight as a threat to its national security, would it dare to strike a Russian cargo plane? With reports suggesting Russia has approved and possibly even delivered advanced ACE-400 missile systems and SU-35 fighter jets to Iran, the stakes continue to rise, potentially upgrading Syria's air defenses in response to Israeli airstrikes. The situation remains tense and unpredictable as Israel navigates its next move while Russia remains heavily involved in the region. Turning now to the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, it's clear that Russia views every inch of territory as crucial to its national interests. The recent capture of strategic areas in Zaporizhia marks a significant development, with Russia emphasizing that all of Zaporizhia is considered Russian soil. This marks a shift in the military strategy, as the region had long been a stronghold for Ukrainian defenses, frustrating Russian forces for years. From Russia's perspective, regaining control of all territories, including Zaporizhia, Donetsk, Luhansk, and Kherson, remains a core objective, and Russia has made it clear that it will not stop until these areas are fully integrated into its territory. The situation continues to evolve, with Ukraine facing significant challenges to hold onto these areas. For Russia, the stakes are high, and the message is unequivocal. The conflict will persist until every inch of what they consider Russian soil is reclaimed. The notion of drawing new lines of demarcation seems out of the question from the Russian viewpoint, as it would mean conceding territory that is constitutionally Russian. Despite the losses sustained in various battles, Russia remains resolute, stating that all of Zaporizhia, Donetsk, Luhansk, and other regions are part of its territory. The larger question looms how will Ukraine respond as Russia pushes forward, and will it lead to further territorial demands in the Pario? Only time will tell, but for now the conflict shows no signs of ending as Russia's objectives remain firmly in place to reclaim every inch of land it deems its own with no compromise. In terms of historical and legal perspectives, Russia has long considered cities like Odessa, Nikolaev, Kharkov, and Sumy to be part of its sphere of influence, given the significant Russian-speaking populations in these areas. However, legally, Russia has not formally made claims on these territories. As it stands, Russia maintains that any territories it deems part of its territory will remain under its control. While there may be considerations in a post-conflict scenario, such as demilitarization or other adjustments, Russia has not yet pursued claims over these regions. That said, should the conflict evolve into a situation where Ukraine fully capitulates and Russia gains complete control, the necessity for Russia to claim Odessa may diminish. But if Ukraine retains a degree of independence, Russia may not be willing to allow Odessa to remain under Ukrainian control due to its proximity and strategic threat to Crimea. Similarly, Territories like Sumy and Kherson are viewed as forfeiting their right to independence due to their use as launch pads for attacks on Russian territory. Russia's position on this matter is clear. It will do whatever is necessary to protect its interests, and any talks of negotiation are unlikely to sway its determination. When discussing nuclear escalation, Russia has made its stance abundantly clear. Any move towards such a conflict will carry dire consequences. The potential for nuclear war is no longer a matter of speculation, but of reality as Russia has unequivocally stated that crossing certain lines will lead to catastrophic repercussions. For those unfamiliar with the full scale of such consequences, one can gain insight by reading Annie Jacobson's book on nuclear war scenarios, which explains how swiftly the world could descend into chaos within a mere 72 minutes. The entire global landscape could change. The book provides a chilling, fact-based look into the decisions and actions of those in charge of nuclear strategy. Though it is a work of fiction, it draws from interviews with the individuals involved, offering a stark view of the automatic and rationalized responses that would take over if a nuclear threshold were crossed. The most disturbing aspect is how, even when the world is on the brink of annihilation, military leaders continue to issue orders as if in command, even though their own survival is no longer possible. This illustrates the terrifying reality of nuclear escalation. Once the threshold is crossed, rationality becomes irrelevant and everything is driven by automatic protocols. For those advocating for increased military support for Ukraine to strike deeper into Russian territory, 
This is the crucial point. Crossing that initial threshold could set in motion irreversible consequences. And while some may trivialize these warnings with ignorant or even flippant comments, the reality is that pushing for such extreme actions is nothing less than advocating for global destruction. People who underestimate the magnitude of the consequences either out of ignorance or arrogance are playing a dangerous game. These are not abstract ideas or hypothetical scenarios. They are real and could lead to the end of life as we know it. In Annie Jacobson's book, the terrifying truth is revealed. Decisions made in the heat of nuclear conflict no longer rest with human judgment alone. Once a system goes into full automatic mode, it becomes a race against time with devastating effects. So to those who continue to downplay the threat and advocate for policies that could trigger such a conflict, think carefully. The consequences of your actions could mean the end for millions. And if you're comfortable with that outcome, then you're truly misguided in your understanding of the stakes. The policies being promoted by some are dangerously misguided, and if enacted, will lead to catastrophic consequences for humanity. Once a war of this scale is initiated, particularly a general nuclear exchange between major powers like the United States and Russia, the outcome becomes inevitable and irreversible. As Annie Jacobson points out, once the initial threshold is crossed, the automatic nature of nuclear protocols takes over. This is the alarming reality if the United States were to engage in a nuclear exchange with North Korea, the trajectory of those missiles will necessarily involve flying over Russian soil. From Russia's perspective, those incoming missiles could easily be perceived as a preemptive decapitation strike aimed at their own strategic assets. And even if no immediate retaliation occurs, the consequences of these missiles hitting their target in North Korea could result in radioactive fallout spilling over into Russia, killing millions. It would be impossible for Russia to ignore such an event and not respond just as China would not stand idly by if radiation spread into their territory, causing widespread loss of life. Once nuclear escalation begins, there is no containment, no way to limit the disaster. It is a chain reaction of uncontrollable devastation. The most destabilizing force in modern warfare is the second strike missile, and it's essential to understand why. Once such missiles are launched, especially when aimed at potential nuclear adversaries like North Korea or Russia, it triggers a response. For nations like China and Russia, operating under launch-on-detection protocols, the moment they detect a missile launch that could potentially target them, they are compelled to respond with their own nuclear arsenal. The fear of leaving even one missile unlaunched and risking an unchallenged strike against their soil forces their hand. This is not a hypothetical scenario. This is the brutal reality of nuclear deterrence and response. The launch of even a single missile has the potential to start an uncontrollable escalation that could obliterate entire populations. The risks are so high that once the missiles are fired, there is no turning back. To those advocating for escalation, particularly the pro-Ukrainian voices calling for attacks on Russian soil, understand this. These actions will not turn the tide of the war in Ukraine. Instead, they could determine the fate of the entire world. The reality is that nuclear war, once initiated, leaves no room for negotiation or de-escalation. I don't need to be right on every detail regarding Ukraine or Iran, but on the issue of nuclear war, I stand firm. We cannot afford to gamble with the future of humanity. The use of long-range missiles, especially ones launched at Russian territory, will not change the outcome of the conflict it will, however, set in motion the kind of global catastrophe that no one will survive. So think carefully about the path we're on. The stakes could not be higher. Jamie Vance, a senator from Ohio, has garnered respect for his military service, having served as a Marine before becoming a combat correspondent during his tour in Iraq. However, his understanding of global strategy appears to be lacking. While Vance emerged from the military with the rank of corporal, it's important to recognize that most of his time was spent as a Lance Corporal, an E3 rank. These service members are the backbone of the military vital to operations but without the responsibility or insight into the larger logistical and operational planning that makes those operations function. The unfortunate truth is that Vance, despite his military experience, lacks any real comprehension of the broader geopolitical landscape, including the conflict in Ukraine, Israel, or Iran. While he may have a sense of the American public's growing frustration with the Ukraine conflict, his views are influenced more by political expediency than a deep understanding of the situation. Without knowledge of key historical factors, such as the U.S.'s covert relationships with Ukrainian nationalist factions, Vance's attempts to navigate these issues fall short and he advocates for policies without grasping the complexities involved. Vance's call for a swift resolution to the war fails to account for Russia's stance. 
His suggestion that the war could be frozen at its current point, with Russia willing to relinquish all territories it claims under its constitution, is an unrealistic and naive proposal. Has Vance, or anyone in his circle, even spoken to the Russians to gauge their position? Russia has made it clear that its constitutional goals involve the full reclamation of its territories, and it is not likely to abandon these claims just to satisfy a political pledge. Vance's approach is not only out of touch with Russia's real intentions, but also ignores the broader geopolitical dynamics, reducing the conflict to a simplistic, feel-good solution that fails to recognize the stakes involved. Germany's role in the conflict is another area where Vance demonstrates a lack of understanding. While he suggests that Germany could take the lead in Ukraine's reconstruction, this proposal overlooks two critics.